Hello. Yesterday I started our series for Lent telling the stories from David Kossoff's Book of Witnesses. People seem to enjoy it when I did it at Christmas and so yesterday I told the story of the beggar who was sitting at the side of the pool when Jesus was brought the woman taken in adultery. Um, and so today I thought I'd read you the story of an old friend of Simon Peter's and of some of the changes that he witnessed uh, in his friendship with Simon. I'm not sure how it was that Simon and I first became friends, although I must try to remember to call him Peter, as everyone else does these days, I'm told. I'm also told that my fisherman friend seems to be engaged in large and rather dangerous work. I would say rather to his own surprise, for I know him well, and the spreading of the teachings of a dead preacher is not really Simon's sort of thing at all. Not the Simon, Peter, that I knew. It is of course possible that he has changed. It's said that the carpenter Jesus changed many of his followers, as indeed a special sort of man can. I never spoke to Jesus or heard him preach. I saw him once in a remarkable almost unbelievable set of circumstances, but more of that later. Peter was there, and I know it was probably the last time I saw my kindly and considerate fisherman friend. You see, I'm not young, at least 30 years older than Peter, who must now be nearly 40. He was 33, 34 when Jesus died. I know they were very much the same age, and I've known him most of his life but not, as it were, to be close friends. He's like his father was, of the sea, of boats, of fish, and I'm a man of books, of words. My first love is poetry. So you see, my fisherman friend and I have very little in common. I know few people. I live here on the side of the mountain, high up alone by choice. They tell me I'm called the Hermit of Tabor, it's true enough. Before I came here, up to the mountain, I lived in Bethsaida, not very far from where Peter and his parents lived. I was very fond of his father Jonas. He was a wise, quiet man. Peter's brother Andrew's very like Jonas, even to the voice and his way of speaking. Peter, he was always the impetuous one, a great energy and strength, a vigorous, loyal man, Oh, the carpenter chose his spreaders of the word very well. I think my friendship with Peter really began when he once brought a saying of Isaiah to me. He'd copied it down and he came in, big, handsome, not long married, in his middle twenties, and he was puzzled. He sensed a prophecy, he said, about one who was to come as a herald of the Messiah, well, fishermen who think about such things as that are rare. And I was intrigued, and so we went into it. And he got into the habit of dropping in to talk and tell me his news, to open his mind and his heart. And he never came empty-handed. Fruit, vegetables, a chicken, but most often of all, fish. I'm very fond of fish. I remember his excitement when he first heard of the preacher from the desert, the Baptist called John. He was sure he must be the herald. He and Andrew made a trip south to see John and to be baptised. And it was on that occasion, or perhaps a similar one later, that he first met Jesus. Not long after that, I moved away from Bethsaida to live up here on the mountain. This hut belonged to an old cousin of mine who was dying. I looked after him, God bless him, till the end. And then stayed on, and I suppose thus our hermits made. About two years later, at roughly the same time as I was considering a trip to Capernaum, where Peter and his family had moved, Peter came to the mountain. Not to see me, that was a coincidence, and a fantastic happening for the hermit of Tabor to witness. I recognised him right away, and two of the three who were with him, they were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They'd been his partners in business. The fourth man, a little ahead of him, was Jesus. Although I didn't know it at that moment, 
not for certain. I assumed it was. I, I felt as though it was. As you see, this hut's overgrown by the two trees that hold it up. It's almost a tree in itself, and it's very difficult to find, for which I'm grateful. I can see, but not be seen. I was going out to meet the four men, but something about their silent ascent gave me pause. Jesus led, and the brothers and Peter just followed, almost as though they were bidden. They crossed the slope below here and began to climb again, until they were about 50 yards above my two trees, and then they stopped. Jesus lifted his hand as though to say, stay, and he walked up another 10 yards or so. No speech, no sound, nothing. No bird song, no wind. No tree noise, nothing. And then, I kid you not, he began to glow. There's no other word. It was as though he was white hot. All the colour went and he was pure white. The purest white I have ever seen, from head to toe. And it hurt the eyes so much I turned away. The three men near to the brightness dropped to the ground, face down. In the shade of the hut, beyond eyelids closed and smarting, I saw the white figure. I turned again and opened my eyes, and now there were two more incandescent figures, one of great age with a beard, and the other lean in a coarse robe leather girdled. The three were speaking together, and Jesus was listening more than speaking, as though he were receiving orders or advice. With eyes nearly shut, I could just about tolerate the brilliance of the light. And Peter and the brothers lay flat down on the ground. In fact, it was Peter who first raised his head. And in a second he was on his feet, his voice thundering across the hillside. Moses, he shouted. Elijah! His voice was wild, hysterical, almost out of control. He shouted out of wonder, in joy. I felt afraid. And then the glow just began to fade and the whole mountainside went into the shadow of a great cloud and I dropped to my knees and hid my head in my arms and Peter's voice died away and a voice a hundred times louder rang round the valley this is my son it said my chosen listen to him all was quiet then and I got up and opened my eyes again Jesus by himself natural, normal, was walking down to Peter. The brothers were on their feet. They listened to Jesus as he spoke quietly to them and then they all walked down the mountain. They passed within 20 yards of my hut. I made no sound or sign. I just felt weak and tired. Living by oneself, you can be conducive to visions, to fancies, to, you know, sounds in your head. But I believe it happened. I believe that I saw it. But when, about three months later, Peter made a journey to see me and spoke of it, he denied it. After wanting to know every detail, almost as though for confirmation, he said a strange thing. He said to me, if such a thing happened, such a wondrous thing, it is not yet time to tell it. There will come a time, he said, when it will all be written down. All of it.